Okay, as we continue our discussion of SN1 reactions, let's look at the relative reactivities of alkyl halides in an SN1 reaction. We know from our previous study that a tertiary carbocation is more stable than a secondary carbocation, which is more stable and easier to form than a primary carbocation. So tertiary alkyl halides are more reactive than secondary alkyl halides, which are more reactive than primary alkyl halides in an SN1 reaction. Primary carbocations and methyl cations are so unstable that primary alkyl halides and methyl ha uh, halides do not undergo SN1 reactions. And you can see on this slide, most reactive is over on the left, tertiary alkyl halides, and the least are over here on the right, primary alkyl halides. And if you think about the mechanism of SN1, we know that a carbocation is formed uh, because the tertiary alkyl halide will easily form a tertiary carbocation, which is more reactive than a secondary carbocation. So you can understand easily from the mechanism why these relative reactivities are as they are. Let's go to the next slide. Here is a slide illustrating carbocation reaction intermediate that leads to the formation of two stereoisomeric products. This helps explain the experimental evidence, the third experimental evidence that we spoke about earlier, and that is in the substitution of a chiral alkyl halide, a racemic mixture of product is obtained. Of course, another way of saying this is if the halogen is bonded to an asymmetric carbon in the alkyl halide, when it undergoes an SN1 reaction, two stereoisomers are formed, one with the same configuration at the asymmetric carbon as the reacting alkyl halide, and the other with the inverted configuration. So the positively charged carbon of the carbocation intermediate is sp2 hybridized. The three bonds connected to it are in the same plane. In the second step of the SN1 reaction, the nucleophile can approach the carbocation from either side of the plane. Those are the three bonds that are made to the sp2 carbon. This results in two possible configurations of the product formed. As you can see here, one on this side and one on this side, depending on which direction the incoming nucleophile goes to, since it can approach from either side of the plane. Of course, this right in here is the carbocation intermediate. This is the sp2 hybridized carbon. This is the alkyl halide reactant. And from this, we can readily see that there are two possible stereoisomeric products formed. So, in an SN1 reaction of an alkyl halide, in which the leaving group is attached to an asymmetric carbon, two stereoisomers are formed because attack of the nucleophile on one side of the planar carbocation forms one stereoisomer, and attack on the other side produces the other stereoisomer. Now here's the asymmetric carbon. This is SN1. Water is going to be our nucleophile. And we can have two stereoisomers, as you can see here, plus HBr is formed. The proton goes with the bromine, forming HBr, and the OH binds to the sp2 carbon. And if the leaving group in an SN1 reaction is attached to a Carilla D center, asymmetric carbon, a pair of enantiomers will be formed as products, which is just another way of saying what we said before. Here's another slide that, that really gives us some ideas of what's going on here. In fact, in reality, we find that there is more inverted product formed in an SN1 reaction. Even though it's racemic and there's both, dissociation of the alkyl halide results in an intimate ion pair. Here's the undissociated molecule. When it begins to uh, dissociate, 
it first forms an intimate ion pair. In this structure, the bond between the carbon and the leaving group has broken, but the cation and anion remain close to each other because of opposite charges. When they move a, just a little more apart, they become a solvent-separated ion pair. Now they got solvent between the two just a little bit. This means an ion pair with one or more solvent molecules between the cation and the anion. As the ions move further apart, they become what we call dissociated ions. And of course, here is the leaving group. X is the leaving group that eventually dissociates completely from the alpha group. So the nucleophile can attack any of these four species, any of these. But the nucleophile attacks only the fully dissociated carbocation over here on the right, the product will be racemized perfectly. If the nucleophile attacks the carbocation of either the intimate ion pair or the solvent separated ion pair, the leaving group will be in a position to partially block the approach of the nucleophile to that side of the carbocation. In other words, this side, the one on the right, since that's the way we've drawn where the leaving group is. So more of the product with the inverted configuration will be formed. This is also illustrated on the next slide. So here's our um, bromine has diffused away and we're left with the cation, the carbon cation, giving water, the nucleophile, equal access to both sides of the carbon cation. That would be in a fully dissociated pair of ions. Over here on the right, the bromine leaving group has not diffused away. There it is. So it blocks the approach of water to one side of the carbocation, again resulting more in the inverted product occurring because it can't form the other product because it's blocked from this side. Let's look at several examples of practice problems. Which of the following factors will favor an SN2 reaction with a negatively charged nucleophile? Uh, you might want to pause the, uh, the video here for a second, this podcast, and look at the answers and select your best answer. So you might want to pause. Okay, let's look. Here is the answer. Of course, all of these are factors that will favor an SN2 reaction with a negatively charged nucleophile, which means it has a pretty good nucleophile. SN2 is favored if we have a good leaving group, good nucleophile, polar aprotic solvent, that's in which the nucleophile and the leaving group are present, and an unhindered reaction center, that's characteristic of the alkyl halide. So all of these, the reaction rate of the SN2 reaction is dependent upon all of these. Look at the next question. Which of the following species is the best nucleophile in methanol? So you might want to pause, come back in just a minute. Now you can see, just looking at this, before we look at the answers, um, one of these actually doesn't have a negative charge, B. So we can el eliminate the amine group right away because it is not going to be a better nucleophile if the others have a negative charge. So we can eliminate that one. And then also, uh, notice oxygen, nitrogen, sulfur, we've got a negative bromine. And this is in methanol, which happens to be a protic solvent. So in a protic solvent, nucleophilicity increases going from right to left in the periodic table and down a group. So right to left, sulfur is to the left of bromine, and sulfur is also below oxygen in the periodic table. So these two here, you might be drawn to those, but sulfur wins out because of its position in the periodic table relative to oxygen and bromine. Okay, let's look at the next one. Which of the following compounds is the poorest nucleophile? Which would be the least attractive to an electrophile? So you might want to pause and take a look at this. 
Okay, let's look at it now. You'll notice that um, each of these, you know, we've got a sulfur, oxygen, oxygen, and all of these. We also have a nitrogen that has a pair of non-bonding electrons. Uh, sulfur, oxygen, and so forth. These four have readily available electrons. Um, whereas we have another structure here that is a very common Lewis acid that accepts electron pairs, which is actually the opposite of a nucleophile. So B is the odd one out, therefore it is the porous nucleophile. Partial racemization can be explained by which of these would you choose? So take a look at that. Now if we look at this, partial racemization, that is implying that one stereo or isomer will be favored over the other, as we were talking about a minute ago, and that one is more present than the other. And looking at this, which of these explains that? And we, we kind of went through uh, the four possible combinations of undissociated um, intimate ion pairs and so forth and dissociated ion pairs. So if you look at this, A, B, C, D, and E, the carbocation must be completely dissociated for complete racemization to occur. We're not looking for complete, we're looking for partial. So B and C are correct. The carbocation must be completely dissociated to complete racemization to occur. And of course, this tight ion pair is comparable to the intimate ion pair. And the fact that the leaving group is still present blocking the nucleophile from one side results in one of the isomers being favored over the other. Okay, I believe this is the last question. Which of the following statements is not true about SM1 reaction of an alkyl halide? So take a look at this one. All right, let's look at, at the answer to this. Notice you have the four choices here, but SN1, uh, the stereochemistry at the reacting carbon is lost. Okay, that's true for SN1. The rate is dependent upon the stability of the carbocation. That's true. The reaction rate is dependent upon the concentration of the nucleophile. Now we know in an SN1 that the concentration of the alkyl halide is what determines the reaction rate. That's the reactant in the first step of SN1. The nucleophile comes in in the second step and it doesn't matter the concentration of the nucleophile. In fact, the second step is very fast and not rate determinant. And D and E are also correct. Okay, that concludes our discussion of SN1.